I always say like if Jen Saki's talking to the press, I'm out here like trying to talk to the people in like normal speak. Right. That's right. <laughs> talk to normal people. That's the goal. Sometimes the press questions don't allow for that. But I know it's <laughs> tough, right? It's tough. Yeah. Because it's you're right. out there doing it. I know. You're playing a, like a constant game of broken telephone where you're like, here's the message. And they're like, rah, 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 right. and then it goes out here's somewhere what else. The pe- here's what people care about. Are they yeah. like focused on Joe Manchin 100 hours a day? I don't think so. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. This week, the podcast is launching a new segment called Politics Girl Candid Conversations, or PGCC, where we'll be joined on the show by guests that are leaders in their field or experts on a topic who will help us better understand the things that are going on around us. The traditional pod is research-based information to fill out the picture so we can all better situate ourselves in this moment. PGCC is a way to bring voices, other than my own, into the conversation. And it's my hope, because I see myself not as a journalist, but as a messenger, that these discussions will be a little less interviewee and a little bit more conversational. Ultimately, the goal of this podcast is to engage you in democracy and inspire you to be an active part of the American experiment. But we always want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's authentic and understandable, because I want you to care. Nothing will ever happen if you don't care. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my guest for the inaugural episode of Politics Girl Candid Conversations, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Thank you. I want you to know that I am, I'm, I'm having my own moment. I wanted to kind of do those Muppet arms, that Kermit Muppet arms. You're like, <laughs> yay, it's Jen, you know. I'll do some like jazz hands over here. We can do it together. Right? Like I'm so excited. <laughs> um, you're basically, for political nerds like me, you're essentially my Ryan Reynolds. So I'm like, really freaking out. You oh, know? man. Okay. I know. He's a good <laughs> so looking actor. I feel good about I that. I know. He's super famous. And, the, and I know, smart. I and know. smart. I don't mean to yeah, downplay his intelligence. No, and he's Canadian. He's Canadian born like go. myself. So there you go. Um, now, I know that I get the luxury of kind of saying whatever I want to say because I have a different venue than you. And so I have my own raw opinions. I put them out into the world. You don't get that opportunity. So I'm going to speak the way I normally speak. And I hope between the two of us, we can kind of find our way for Americans who are just like me to kind of find their way into this moment where we can get some insight and move forward and make people feel just a little bit better. Does that sound good? That sounds great. And I, and I love what you do and that you're speaking to to real people in the country and Americans. Uh, so thank you for everything you do. I, I do have kind of a joking list I have that is uh, SHIT. I will say on a podcast one day when I'm out of government. I will not say all that now, but just so you all know, right. I do. But you I do, do know, know you what do it know. Is. You do know yeah. what it means. And you're not going to be shocked if I do it. All right. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Um, OK, so there's an old New Yorker cartoon where a person is at the doctor and they're sitting at the table and the doctor's got his little thing and he says like, OK, I see your problem. Um, you've been paying attention, right? <laughs> It's an old New Yorker cartoon, and I feel like that every day now. What would you say to people who are feeling overwhelmed and kind of discouraged at this moment? You know, you're obviously more immersed in it than most of us are, um, probably even more so. So how are you staying positive and sane during this time? As a person? um, Well, as as a person, sure. But even as a political pundit, you know, like looking at what's going on. Look, I I wouldn't be in this business if I as long as I have been, if I wasn't an optimist, you know, and I think what keeps me going is that I think things are going to get better. And, you know, it feels and but I think we also have to acknowledge and be real about how hard this is. You know, I mean, I have two little kids. Um, School's canceled because of snow, but also sometimes it's canceled because of, you know, teachers getting covid. And I know some people are experiencing that around the country. I get it. Right. Uh, it's hard. And I think we sometimes don't have to all say it's okay all the time. It's not okay all the time. Um, And just be in that, right? Um, What gets me going is, or keeps me going, I should say, as as a professional and living what I live and knowing what I know every day is that, you know, I know we're in a different place than we were a year ago, right? And we may not feel that way every moment, but we have vaccines. We have Pfizer pills. Those are a game changer, right? We just ordered 20 million of those. um, And those are going to be available to people around the country. Uh, People can order, um, they can order tests now online. Masks are going to be everywhere. We are in a very, very different place than we were a year ago. I think what is real to people's everyday life um, is that it doesn't feel different, right? Because you can't just go to concerts and you can't go to restaurants and 
Um, you know, life isn't what it what it was before the pandemic. Um, but what what I'm pretty confident in or I feel good about is knowing that it's not always going to be this way. And that the more things we have, the Pfizer pill, when kids under five, and I have a, I have a son under five, so believe me, I get that, um, get approved for vaccines, things are going to keep getting better. Oh my gosh, wouldn't that be great? You know, we're sitting here at the one-year mark of the Biden administration, and by any traditional metric, like if you were paying attention, we're doing quite well. You know, the economy has bounced back, the yeah. unemployment levels are low, we have, like you said, the multiple free vaccines, these new um, therapeutics coming out. Um, Biden's basically handled the mess that he was handed beautifully and with honor and class. And we can kind of see that brought back to the White House. I loved what they did at Christmas uh, with the the American Ballet Theater in there and everything. It was just so gorgeous. Um, and yet, if you go to Twitter or you go on the news or you listen to the media, it's a absolute mess. You know, he's yeah. he's got terrible poll numbers. He's failing at everything. You know, can you talk me through that disconnect? How something can actually be going well, and yet what we hear, just regular people out here in the world, is that everything is a disaster. Well, here's what we know. Aside from you, Twitter is not real life. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, Twitter is very. And look, I'm on Twitter. Twitter is a tool of communicating with um, with reporters, with a range of people. Um, but, you know, Twitter is also very coastal, it's liberal, and it's pretty white. That is not the totality of the country. Uh, but what I will say is that um, it also, um, sometimes what we also see out there for people who are digesting it and are feeling really dark is, um, you know, a, a drive at the worst and the worst things that are happening about all the things, right? And there are good things that are happening. Um, and we can also celebrate those. Doesn't mean we don't acknowledge that costs are still too high, that when you go to the grocery store and meat is more expensive than it was a year ago, you can be pissed off about that. We can still acknowledge that, but we have more jobs now. We created more jobs in the first year than any president in history, right? Yeah, 3.9% unemployment is so low. It is almost full employment in the country. There mm -hmm. are so many jobs. The problem that companies have nowadays is they can't hire enough people. Uh, and that feels like a crisis for companies in many ways it is, but also means it's a worker's market. That means if you're looking for a job or if you're in a job you hate, go leave your job, get a job with better pay and more benefits. That's a good thing. That's what we've been striving for. So there are things to celebrate. Uh, I think sometimes what people, what happens out there is everything is black and white, right? It's either awesome or it's terrible. That's not actually life. That's not the real world. And so it's good to, rem to take a moment to relish in what's good, even as we acknowledge what still needs more work. Yeah. And I think well, I think what you're saying about awesome and terrible is interesting because we have become so polarized. You know, it's right and yeah. left, it's red and blue, it's bad or good. You know, there's and there's so many nuances and so many shades of gray that we forget about. I mean, you've got this infrastructure bill <laughs> that like we've been talking about for 50 years and it finally got passed and people are like, wow, yeah, you know, about it. And I right. think, oh my God, this is a huge big deal. And when the jobs actually start coming to people's towns, I hope that they acknowledge that this is such a huge big deal. I'm sure you guys are proud of it over there. You should be. Totally. And look, Infrastructure Bill is such a good example. Um, Mitch Landrieu, who you should totally talk to because he's great and fun. Um, and he was, he said, came to the briefing with me and he said, and Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi says this, but it's just the funniest quote from him for some reason, where he was like, you may vote no, but you still want the dough. And his point is, infrastructure is one of those things that people are going to tout and brag about even if they didn't vote for it because you absolutely know why? they're already doing it yeah because you know <laughs> why bridges are bridges are not republican or democratic um you know some of them are kind of democratic because you know but you know we got some republican votes but yeah um they're not i mean they're just things people want to make their lives better so they can drive and not be scared of driving across the bridge, right? So, yeah. you know, that is such a good example. I mean, the other things in that package that now we're gonna implement, which is the exciting and cool part, is replacing lead pipes, right? Oh. I mean, there are, I think it's 400,000 schools that have had lead pipes. I mean, that is crazy. Lead pipes where your kids are at school and the water going through the pipes is going through lead pipes. We're replacing those. There's not gonna be any lead pipes in the country anymore. Clean drinking water, that's gonna be have a huge impact on lower income communities. We're also gonna expand access to broadband, which in human terms is high speed <laughs> internet, right? High speed internet, I the word broadband, I, I know, I don't like, think anybody understands what that is. I barely yeah. do. Yeah. Um, high speed internet, right? So it means, right, that when you're in your house and you're trying to work from home uh, over the last year, but a lot of people still are, 
and you can't get high speed internet, we want to change that. Everybody should have high speed internet or your kids are at home uh, and hopefully we're not we're not shutting down schools. More than 95 percent are open. But, um, you know, back a year ago, kids who didn't have Internet access, they couldn't uh, even participate in school. We don't want yeah. that to be the case. No, you saw all those kids in parking lots yeah, to, exactly. Chipotle and, and Starbucks and like that shouldn't happen in a first world country like ours. We should really yeah. all be connected. And that's the world now. Right. That's how we get all of our information. It's how we get our schooling. It's how we learn about things. We have to be online. And so the the uh, draw to that is so important, I think, for yeah. a modern society anyway. Um, and yeah. that's all good. We love we love all these things. These are all great things that we can look forward to um, coming to our towns and coming to our non-broken bridges that won't fall into rivers, yeah. which we don't <laughs> yeah, want. Exactly. Um, no one wants that. No one likes no a one pothole. Wants that. No one wants that. And if we're feeling hopeful, that's really great. But then it takes us like two seconds to feel depressed again because we watched what just happened in the Senate, right? Like it just happened. And it's heartbreaking and discouraging and this idea that we could live in America, this shining pillar of democracy where our vote is under attack, you know, that our votes yeah. are going to be suppressed or thrown out. And that is scary to a lot of people. I mean, truly scary. They are justifiably anxious. And this alternative that the Republicans are going to just come in, steamroll us, and then what they're offering is basically closer to autocracy than democracy. If we're going to start impeaching Biden, impeaching Harris, throwing Fauci in jail, you know, all these things they're threatening to do. Yeah, um, I may be in jail. I don't even know what's going to happen. What I'm, honestly, <laughs> Jen, you and I, we can share a cell. I'm telling we're you, they're coming to get me. I can, I can have worse cellmates. <laughs> I, I say all the time, I'm like, where are the capitalists in this? Do they not know that if you start taking like everyone that's criticized you off the air, like that's most of our television, <laughs> Like yeah. See you late night shows. True. See you like regular TV shows. Like it's a real shame. Um, I don't think the capitalists are thinking this through. That would be very hard <laughs> on the market. Um, yeah. But, you know, what do we do? Does the White House have this sense of urgency? Because obviously um, President Biden did this great speech about voting rights and like really, really spoke in clean yeah. terms that people can understand about the seriousness of this moment. But then what are the next steps if we can't get voter protections at a federal level? Where, where are we going without going down a dark hole where we feel like we're dead forever? Well, first, we can't give up. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it feels really dark right now on that. It I totally does. get it. I mean, putting the two Democrats aside who don't want to change voter rules, and we can come back to that. But um, there are 16 Republicans in the Senate who have supported voter protections in the past, have supported them in the past. Mitch McConnell wrote about it in his book. He was so proud. He's talked on the Senate floor about protecting voter rights. You know why? Because voting protections doesn't mean you determine if somebody votes Democratic or Republican. It just determines that they can vote and exercise their right. So, you know, I, I think one of the things we just have to keep doing is not be depressed and stay at it. And I know and have lived through politics and the ups and downs of legislation a lot, uh, enough to know that grassroots activism, people yelling and shouting about these things works. Does it work as quickly as we want it to work always? It doesn't. But the voting rights protections is such a good example. And the more we can talk about it in terms that people understand, the better, right? Because when we say protecting people's right to vote, what do we mean? We mean that if you're a mother with three kids and you're trying to vote and participate in the process, you should have lots of places you can drop off your ballot. We mean that if you are um, same mother, maybe it's her cousin who has four kids, I don't know, but like same family, let's just make it the same family, you know, that if you are trying to vote, you should be able to early vote. You shouldn't have to take a day off of work to do it. Um, uh, we know Election Day, making that a holiday would help more people participate. There's a long history of states where being able to mail in your ballot or having early voting means more people participate in the process. That is good. What are Republicans so freaking scared of? Of more people voting? That means yes, they'll lose? That's yeah, that's obviously. exactly yes. it. I mean, I, I you know, answered we my had, own question. You answered that was your like own a question. rhetorical <laughs> question. But um, like, that is exactly yeah, right. I think Jennifer. We just have to be we have to stay at it and not get down. And you know, it, it is we can be down, be down for a minute. You know what I mean? Like have your have your margarita and then the next day wake up and keep the fight going because that's yeah. the only yeah. way to change it. Now, as we look to November, what the key thing is, um, is that we need to make sure that voters are educated on what their rights are and that they know that there are voter protection systems, there are voter protection support in every state. Now, that doesn't change our still fight for federal legislation. We are still fighting for that. But like we also need to make sure people know their rights. 
Yeah, I think that's important because I think a lot of people feel like now, well, this is it. My vote's just going to get thrown out. And so they need to know at the state level what they do to make sure their vote was counted, make sure their vote is there. Even if they're waiting eight hours in line, they get prepared for that. And our hope would be that we could not only keep the House, which is essential, but add to the Senate so that the voting rights bills can come back. We can bring them back, right? I mean, we can't just give up on them because they failed what are we at now? Five times. Um, but this last one once, um, because clearly you, as you answered your own question before, who doesn't want people voting? There's clearly one party that's for letting Americans vote. And there's one party that doesn't want Americans to vote because it doesn't serve them. And that doesn't serve democracy. And I think we need to get that message out a lot clearer because I've talked to Republican family members who are like, well, you know, who says you can't vote? And I'm like, it's not about just voting. It's about those mothers you were talking about, you know, making it easier for them. I do a section on the show called Palette Cleanser where we just don't talk about politics because it's just too okay, much. I love we can't, it. No okay. one can bear it and we need to take a little break. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's anything you watch on TV or a movie that you've recently liked or a book um, because how do you chill out? How do you remove yourself from your job? Because I know that if I had your job, I would be throwing myself off the stage and just throttling people. And I am just so glad that you don't do that. Very well done. Very professional. Um, but how do you manage to keep kind of chill? Is Because I just don't have enough Xanax for this time in history. You know, I don't oh, know how you're doing worry. it. But like, what are you chilling? What, what's making you happy when you're not doing politics? Oh, my God. I mean, first of all, most of my friends have nothing to do with politics. They're like normal human beings who have nothing to do well with played. politics. Don't care mm-hmm. that I'm in politics, you know? It's like, there's not, no <laughs> like, concern to them. My three-year-old son thinks I work at the Honda dealership. He loves cars. So, you know, it's all it's all bringing you down to earth. Um, <laughs> I am a big reader. Um, I recently read of, of, of Fates and Furies, which is an amazing book. It's a little dark, but really, really good. Um, I also uh, recently watched Coda, the movie. I'm a little behind. Like, I feel like this book and this movie came out like a year or two years ago. But you know, um, but Coda, have you, have you heard of this movie? Marley Matlin's movie? Oh my God. Yes. Uh, Children oh, of Death yes, Adults. I have, I'm going to like have. cry it's just amazing. thinking about this movie because it's- Oh it is, my goodness. Whoa. It's so good, isn't oh, yeah. it? Yeah, it's so good. We should really um, rave about that. I also, I, I am still a loyal watcher of Grey's Anatomy which I feel like when I meet people who also watch Grey's Anatomy and know what Dr. Bailey is up to, we need like a secret handshake or something because there's like, I don't know how many people still watch it. I still oh watch it. Oh my God. I, I love that you're still watching Grey's Anatomy. That's just something know. so like, that's the thing. We all need a little bit of comfort food, right? And like um, for you, that's it's it, comfort right? Food. Like, we need something that says it's okay because we've counted on America being the same way for a long time. And right now yeah. we're in this absolute period of turmoil and it feels terrifying some days yes. and to have a Grey's Anatomy to have a something that you go back to and you say like you know nope I'm okay I'm okay and I can get up again and do it all over again tomorrow it's totally Queer Eye I've been oh, watching God. a new season of Queer Eye which the positivity I right couldn't we add more positivity <laughs> it's like yeah it's positivity but no I can't it's look I love politics I love policy I'm a nerd I think you are too whether you admit it or not that you're oh a I'm a hundred percent a nerd I love it I learned something new every day I got to sit in on this meeting with the PCAS the science advisors so everybody had won a Nobel Prize except for me in the room I don't know but I love that but when I get home I like roll on the ground with my kids and then I go watch like an episode of Queer Eye because you need to kind of come down from the universe of everything, right? Yeah, we should all come down. We should all come down a little bit because I think that you got to replenish your energy to go back in the next day. And so whatever it is. Leave, Leave the space for that. <laughs> we have to leave the space for that so we can we can get up and do it all over again. This podcast is sponsored by Wondrium. I'm someone who loves to learn. I'm a nerd and I fully accept it. There's an old expression that you don't stop playing because you get old, you get old because you stop playing. Well, I think learning is the same. We should never stop learning. It's never done. And a company like Wondrium is such a help if you wanna be inspired to expand your mind. Is there something you've always wanted to know about? Something you're interested in? Something you've always been curious about? Well, now it doesn't have to just float around inside your head. You can actually learn about it with Wondrium. I'm currently working through a series called Death, Dying, and the Afterlife. It explores death through different cultures, faiths, and philosophies. One episode is about dying well. There's an episode about overcoming grief. There's even a whole episode that questions if death is even bad. I'm loving it, it's fascinating. Being someone who's very sick, but also someone just living through this pandemic, 
I feel like I needed this series. It may sound depressing, but if anything, the whole thing has given me a real sense of peace and hope. And that's the thing about Wondrium. Whatever you're interested in, it's there. Science, history, music, language, travel, health, business, there is something for everyone. They have video and audio learning experiences and interactive how-to guides and documentaries. And it reminds you that learning can be something truly enjoyable. And right now, my listeners get a free 22-day trial offer to celebrate the new year. But you need to sign up using my URL, wondrium.com slash politicsgirl. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash politicsgirl. And inspire your mind today. So I sit at a computer all day. I mean, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say I can be on a screen 14 plus hours a day. So my eyes hurt. They water. I get headaches and digital eye strain. I heard blue light glasses could help, so I tried a bunch of them. Nothing. If anything, they made my eyes feel more tired. It was a little bit better when I had blue filters put into my reading glasses, but my favorites are my Blue Blocks blue light computer glasses. They're clear lens glasses outfitted with my prescription that were delivered right to my house. And I'm not blowing smoke when I say I like them better than my wildly expensive ones from the optometrist. Blue Box are made in optics laboratories in Australia. They have stylish frames that have been featured in GQ and Vogue. I personally chose these like 70s easy rider aviator kind of look. They're a little more expensive than other brands, but it's worth the investment to get the relief. And honestly, if I just bought these ones first, I would have actually saved money rather than wasting it on all these other pairs. Blue Box glasses come in non-prescription, prescription, and reading options. They have glasses for every need. Blue light for digital eye strain, summer glow with yellow lenses for helping with low mood, and sleep plus with amber lenses for improving sleep. So go to blueblocks.com slash politicsgirl and use the coupon code politicsgirl to save 15% at checkout. They ship in rapid time and have easy returns and exchanges. In a world of screens, we ask a lot of our eyes. Let's take care of them. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash politicsgirl and have your eyes start feeling a little better today. Today's podcast is supported by Athletic Greens. So it was 10 o'clock in the morning the other day and I realized I hadn't had a cup of coffee. I forgot to have one. How bananas is that? Do you know what it's like when you're over 40? You start the day with freaking coffee. But since starting my days with one scoop of Athletic Greens, my energy is different. I'm perkier on my own and I feel so much better. Athletic Greens special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, anti-aging, sleep, all the things. It's an all-in-one nutritional insurance for your body. I'd been working for hours and was like, wait, did I not have a coffee? Athletic Greens is a once a day micro habit that uses the best products and is based on the latest science. In fact, its current formula is on its 53rd iteration because they're constantly updating it as the science advances. And I have to say that with one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no chemicals, no artificial anything, it is absolutely working. If you wanna join my journey to better gut health an optimized immune system and more natural energy, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl and Athletic Greens will give you one free year of immune supporting vitamin D, which most of us do not get enough of, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. That's athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl to get the ultimate in daily nutrition. No coffee. What? Oh, oh there we go. There can we you are. Hear me now? Okay, there we go. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay, so I've got I've got Jen Zaki here. She's she's back. She's in a new location. She's giving me some window love. Same desk, different love. visual. <laughs> yes. Well, this is great. This is great. So, you know, this is probably a good moment to switch back to COVID. We were talking about um, you know, what you've got going on in this new uh, Pfizer pharmaceutical that you've coming out. Obviously, COVID is an ongoing problem. You guys have been very clear with your message. Get vaccinated, get boosted, wear a proper fitting mask. Um, but the information changes depending on what state you live in. You know, it depends on what channel you listen to. Um, what do you do with a virus that's been politicized? You try to be humble about who the right messengers are, okay. in part, right? Which means that... Uh, Everybody is not going to listen to Joe Biden or me or Kamala Harris or um, a range of or Dr. Fauci. Right. Um, And we have tried to be humble about who we partner with, recognizing, you know, it's funny. We always got the question early on, like, why don't you partner with this famous Republican actor or, you know, Donald Trump or whatever it is? Because the most trusted people in communities are usually people in their communities, which is, you know, politics 101 in some ways. But um, so we've we've tried to invest a lot in that. Um, And that is why um, 
you know, we keep telling people, go talk to your pediatrician if you have questions about getting your kids vaccinated, right? Or talk to your doctor if you have questions. Um, you know, we've tried to use a lot of, uh, of ways of reaching people in their communities that is not just uh, pushing out uh, information from the White House, because we know that's not always going to be effective. So, you know, we, we feel like, we, we, of course, there's always more work to do, but 75% of the country has had two doses. All those people didn't vote for Joe Biden, right? Um, and so we feel like there's been some success in that, but there's more work to do. Is that the statistic? 75% of the country has now had two doses? Yeah. That's a wonderful statistic. It's, yeah. According to the CDC, is fully vaccinated. Actually higher than that. It's 83% or maybe 84 at this point who've had at least one dose. Well, that's Who, wonderful news. Adults. Yeah, an eligible adult. Yeah, it's it's very good news. It's very good I, news. I, I now, feel like also, I wish that was out there more because uh, I think people do what their friends are doing, you know? Totally. <laughs> if you hear that many That's people, actually, Americans, yeah. are getting it, you're like, oh, shoot, I haven't got it. Like, everyone's getting it. Like, I everyone's honestly feel it. like that's yeah. very, that's a very that's cool a, That's a better way of saying what I was trying to say. I mean, you know, my daughter's six. And when I got, when we went to get her vaccine, um, she had kind of a play date with friends, uh, you know, a couple of days later. And they were like high-fiving about how they'd gotten vaccinated. Right. You know, which is, I know it's that like happens not in every community. But, you know, it's kind of, if you make it, it's right. It's like your neighbor got vaccinated and they didn't have any major impacts or maybe they didn't they had a little headache for a minute but um you know that's what tells people that's like what their friends and neighbors do and so pediatrician is a good example of that but people in communities so we yeah, really no, i was talking to- i was talking to the guy at fedex the other day and he was saying he was like oh i got the vaccine but i got i got sick and i was like oh did you go to the hospital and he was like no. And I was like, did you have to have like a ventilation tube or have any out through? And he was like, no, no, it was just like a cold. And I'm like, well, that was the point. Right. And he was like, I think, yeah, that is the point. Like, I didn't get really sick. I was like, I think that's the point. Like, and he was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, my brother got sick, too, but he didn't have to go to the hospital. And I was like, I think that's the point. And it was like, so I, funny. Like, it, it was yeah. like his he was like, oh, my God, of course. Like he his initial thought was I had the vaccine, but then I got sick. But then I was like, how sick did you get? And He was like, not sick at all, which was a great combination and it was just us chatting at the door because I have everything delivered because totally. I never leave my house. And then you're like, oh, okay, maybe getting those vaccines is not bad. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I have COVID and I just had minor symptoms and now we know this. Here's, I'll give you another good stat. You're 17% more likely, 17 times, sorry, more likely to get be hospitalized if you're unvaccinated versus vaccinated and 20 times more likely to die. Does that mean you won't get COVID? No, there are people who get COVID uh, who are vaccinated, but you're in a much better circumstance. And that's the point. Yeah. And I think the point is to keep people away from being that ill. You know, I think people forget. Yeah. You know, we have people now in our neighborhood who are very much like, oh, my God, let me just get it over with, you know, and the, it's sort of a chicken pox party mentality. And yeah, no, I think don't people do that. For, no, don't do that. And I think the thing is, yeah. is that people forget that you don't know how your body will react to it. So you want to protect yeah. yourself as well as possible. But people just don't know what it's like to be in the hospital. Our poor healthcare workers are yeah. absolutely drowning. But as someone who has spent a fair amount of time in hospitals, you don't want to go there if you don't have to. You know, do yeah. everything you can to protect yourself from from getting into that position. Um, exactly. No, I, I want to talk to you uh, about a couple extra things before you go because I know you're a very busy lady. Sure. But one of the things that is really on everyone's mind is the Supreme Court, right? Because we have these three new justices joining two justices that were there that seem to have a very clear political agenda. Um, and it's not the political agenda of the majority of the country. You know, uh, women's right to the autonomy over her own body is under attack. Texas currently has bounties on our head. It seems like it's a done deal on Roe versus Wade. So I understand that the president has a commission looking into the Supreme Court. Can you tell us about that or where we're at with that or how that goes? Because I yeah. know a lot of people are like, I can't with this court. I know. It's stressful. Believe me. It um, is. You know, oh I would say he has his commission. They've given him a report. They gave it to him in November. He's got to review it. Uh, the commission is a bipartisan commission. So, I mean, it's a commission of people with a lot of different viewpoints because what he wanted them to look at is the history of a lot of big questions, right? Like, why are you on the Supreme Court until you die? Good question. We should look at that, you know? Should the court be expanded? A question a lot of people are raising. Um, it's not, it doesn't make recommendations. It just looks at all of the uh, history and different arguments and the impacts. Um, 
And so, you know, that's what he's looking at now to see what he thinks and how and how court cases are chosen. Even how does the Supreme Court decide to take up a case? Um, so those are a lot of things that, that have been around for a long time. Uh, but he thought it was worth taking a big picture look at. Oh, it's an absolute worth taking a big picture look at. I mean, the court to regular Joe Schmo people like me seems very outdated. You know, it's the concept of having nine Supreme Court justices, but 13 federal districts makes very little sense, right? It does make more sense to have more people. Um, it the, the whole lifetime appointment thing seems bizarre because it's what other job are we just sort of waiting for someone to keel over during someone's presidency for you to put a new person in that job? And, and then if you have things like the shadow docket, which I'm not sure how familiar people are with, um, but just that the judges themselves can decide what they take up and then do it kind of quietly in the dead of night and then just make decisions without the rest of us hearing the arguments. That feels like a problem when the arguments they're making and the decisions they're making affect all of us. This decision from Texas went through on the shadow docket, right? We didn't even get to hear about it. It was like, yeah, that's cool, you know, uh, and I don't think that that's the way to make decisions. And I certainly don't think we should have been having Congress make laws that are then changed by nine people. I think a lot of people feel frustrated by that. So if the president has a commission, which seems very smart, what comes after that? He goes through it, he reviews it, and then... Well, I think he's got to decide if, if he wants to make or recommend, um, you know, any changes. And it depends on what they are. And, uh, you know, I, I would suspect most of it would take... A congressional action. I'm not sure I'd have to look more closely at it. But, um, you know, I think it is a lot of people have good questions that you raised, right? And yeah. uh, are wondering, yeah. you know, things like the abortion case, I think really opened a lot of people's eyes who were like, wait, what? <laughs> what? What is this court doing? Hold on a second. What is this law doing in Texas? You mean if you take someone to go get an abortion, they're in trouble? That's insane. So, yeah, you know, yeah. there, there are cases like that that have made people Google probably Supreme Court books. How does it work? You know, how, what can I know more about? Um, and there's no question about that. And the, the president is, you know, he's the former chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He takes these issues extremely seriously. He wants a lot of pages of briefing materials on everything, including an issue as important as this with so much history. So he's going to take some time to take a look at it, but uh, wanted the commission to give him a full a full assessment. Yeah, I think that's smart because ultimately we want uh, our court to survive, right? It's, it's wonderful to have a Supreme Court, but we need to have faith in it. And if it looks like the public perception is this is just an arm of one of the other one of the other parties, it's not going to work. You know, eventually someone will say, well, I don't. I don't believe in that decision. I don't believe in that. And then we are really in trouble. So I think he's very smart to take it seriously. I would say that the other issue we really have here with being a Democrat and, and being a spokesperson for the Democrats in general is that we have a bit of a messaging problem. Like it doesn't matter what successes we have if people don't know about it. And yeah. the Biden presidency has gone back to this kind of <clears throat> more traditional way of communicating. And you do the daily press briefings. We didn't get them every day before. And you're doing an awesome job. We obviously learned a lot about what the press secretary does watching it over the past administration. But what do you do if you're talking to people who aren't actually looking for truth and answers? They're looking for sound bites that they can spin into their own narrative. You know, what do we do using a traditional way of communicating in a new forum? This is not how people normally get their news anymore. I don't turn on the news at six yeah. o'clock and hear what Walter Cronkite is saying, right? That's not how I'm getting my news. I'm seeing- Good thing you're not looking for Walter Cronkite. You'd have a hard time. You wouldn't find right? him. It would, that would take yeah. me a long time on the 700 <laughs> channels and I still would not find him. Um, right. but, but the thing is, is that ultimately, you know, you speak to the press, the press takes what they want out of it and then they go publish what they want to, or they yeah. report on what they want. And ultimately, those of us at home often just see you- duking it out with one or two reporters who say something inane and you clarify it and then that becomes a sound bite. But that's not how people learn anything. It's what it's how they stick to their sides. So a hundred percent. You're preaching to the choir. I'm picking I up what know. you're putting so down. What do all we the do to kind of get that actual message through to the people in a different way? Is there a different way to do it? Well look, I think first the briefing is something that is important because it's a part of our democracy, but it is hardly the only thing we can do, should do, or are doing. So um, what people should understand, and we are welcoming suggestions, Go, send them to you. Um, of, I got suggestions, Jen. Podcasts, we should do ways we should get information out 
you know, the thing is, is what we're trying to do is meet people where they are in the country, right? What people don't know is the White House doesn't have a budget to put information out. Like we don't have an advertising budget or anything like that. I know, shouldn't we? That would be so fun. But, But we don't. But what we do have is a huge megaphone to communicate through lots of different ways, right? Through our social platforms, And we're always looking for different ways to engage with people and talk to them and get them information. We fully recognize, and you hit the nail on the head, the conversations that I'm having in the briefing room, important not to diminish the White House press corps, are not what people are talking about at home, right? Uh, No one is sitting around asking their neighbor or their friend or their husband what Joe Manchin had for breakfast. No one in in this country. Um, And that... Often a lot of what we focus on is what is happening in the zip code, not as what is happening in the country. Um, And we are very aware of that. And so I would say um, what we're trying to do uh, and what the president wants to do and is open to doing um, is doing a lot more different formats, whether it's podcasts or different social media platforms. We do a lot on our platforms, but continuing to do more of that and looking for more ways to engage and getting out in the country more because you know, we don't want the conversation to revolve around what's happening in this in this uh, zip code. That's not what everybody's talking about. No, and and they shouldn't be, honestly. And I love the idea that you guys are open to that. And you might find something in your email box for me in the future because I've got plans. I've got Same I've got ideas. Suggestions will take up. Yeah. <laughs> watch what you watch what you say. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be like type 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 type. Good, good, um, good. Type it up. Yeah, I think the thing is is that pe- it, things feel dark right now. You know, we can all work so hard to get all three houses of government. You know, we can work so hard to hold the House or expand the Senate. But we just want to know that uh, the government is behind us, that they see the urgency of this moment and yeah. that the our generals and our leaders um, are behind the people who are working so hard in the streets. Because I know often what you see in social media and in the grassroots is people just saying, like, are we out here on our own? Do they get that this is a problem or is it just sort of business as usual? And I think people want to know that you have our backs. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, we have your backs and the president has your backs. And I think what the president has been telling us about nonstop constantly is he wants to get out of the White House and not, I don't mean leave the presidency. That sounds dramatic. <laughs> but that he does I mean, I mean Holy hell. he wants to go, you know, he, and part of this is COVID, right? And, and this is part of, I guess, he's living a different version. I'm not saying it's so rough traveling on Air Force One places, but he hasn't traveled as much as he you would normally travel as president or even as he traveled as vice president. And he wants to hear from people yeah. in their communities, people who agree with him and disagree with him. That's kind of a healthy yeah. part of what we do. One of the things I love the most about this job is traveling with him and doing that and seeing him light up when he is talking to people in a rope line or at an event or just in an ice cream shop or whatever it may be. Um, But, you know, I think people need to know that when he wakes up every day, he talks about the people he grew up with. I mean, he grew up in a lower middle class house, depending on how he describes it, uh, with a multi-generational home at many times. Uh, He didn't have a lot. um, And uh, he knows uh, what it's like to, to worry about putting food on the table and and what what you need to do to make it by. And that's been the driver for him through his entire career. And so people should know that's what's on his mind every day. I mean, and when voting rights doesn't pass and when, you know, you don't you don't get to create a universal pre-K program when you want to. He's his heart's broken by it, you know, and he feels real sad about it. And people should know that, too. Uh, but, you know, you don't get to always see that. It's kind of no. a weird thing. The presidency yeah. in some ways. It's a very weird thing, actually. It removes you from the people that you want to serve the most. And clearly, uh, yeah. Joe Biden is, if nothing else, he's a man of the people. When he is out there, you know, on the floors of factories and getting into it with people, like you said, who don't even agree with him necessarily, it's a real person. And he clearly cares about yeah. the real people. And so those of us out here doing the work and pushing for democracy and trying to make everything better, um, it's nice to know that our leadership gets the moment um, as well as we do. Because sometimes I feel like we just live in a cesspool of lies and it's very hard to kind of get your head up from it. Um, Hard to wade through. It is, it is. It's very mucky. Yeah, it's very mucky. So listen, Jen, I I know this is all the time you have and I so appreciate it. I could sit here and talk to you all day long, but you've got stuff. I love it. We'll do it again. Um, But uh, let's do it again. I would love it because I know how busy you are, but I know how much it means to people to really hear uh, what's going on in just 
conversation, right? And in, in real speak, because we are all out here trying to do our best by the country and we've got to come together and we've got to save this beautiful democracy for a future generation. And I'm assuming that is your goal as well as mine. So let's do it again and keep up the fantastic work. And I'm very, very proud of you for not killing anyone. Well done. <laughs> Let me just say first, thank you for what you do and like speaking real talk and human talk and explaining things that are not always explained the best way to people. And that's such a huge role. So uh, we'll do it again. And we'll I'll introduce it. you to fun people who work here, too. To let's do let's about. talk infrastructure. Let's talk climate. Let's do all the things. Yeah. Fun nerds. Fun nerds. That's fun nerds. Like. That's what we should be. <laughs> yeah. Thank all you right. so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Great talking with you. So that was White House Press Secretary and my brain crush, Jen Psaki, reminding us that it's okay to recognize that this is a difficult time, that we can feel discouraged, but then we have to come back and fight again because America is worth it and the president has our backs. Now go out and make the world a better place. Find your own Grey's Anatomy to help you decompress and get ready to fight those compromised liars and con men for the heart of our country. I'd like to thank Jen for joining us today and thank you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.